Our reading today can be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 26 through 31. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Humanity no longer fears God. Perhaps this is not surprising, since so many humans no longer believe that there is a God to fear. But even among those who do believe in a God, whether it be one God, many gods, or some other sort of higher power, even still fear is out of fashion. For many today, if there is a God, God is either entirely benevolent or entirely indifferent. That is, God is either all-loving or uncaring. The former God is doing the best that he can to help us, and the other is unconcerned with our welfare. In either case, though, there is nothing about God to fear. If God is all-loving, then he's always on our side. If God is indifferent, then he's not acting against us in any deliberate way. Neither God, though, is the God of the Christian scriptures. The Christian scriptures have neither described God as all-loving nor as indifferent. When God revealed his glory to Moses, as preserved for us in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7, Yahweh described himself as follows, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. When Yahweh revealed his glory to Moses, he described himself in nine ways. First, he described himself as merciful. The Hebrew word is rachum, and it related to the, it's related to the word rachem, which means womb. It describes a compassionate person, one who can be moved to sympathy or empathy for one who suffers. So God has first described himself as one who can be moved to sympathy or empathy for one who suffers. Second, God revealed himself as gracious. The Hebrew word is chanun, and it's only used in the First Testament to describe God. It occurs in Exodus chapter 22, verses 24 through 27, and in that context, it describes God's willingness to hear the cries of a person who has been cheated by a neighbor. So God has declared himself to be one who hears the cries of those who have been treated unfairly or unjustly. Third, God reveals himself as slow to anger. The Hebrew phrase is literally long of nostril or long of nose, and refers to one who has learned patience as they have grown older. So God has declared himself not to be short-tempered, but instead to be patient. Fourth, God revealed himself as abounding in steadfast love. The Hebrew phrase here is rav chesed, and it describes one who is true to their word, always doing what they have said they would do, and never doing what they said they would not do. So God has declared himself as one who always speaks the truth and follows through with what he has said. Fifth, God revealed himself as abounding in faithfulness. The Hebrew is Rav Emet, and it describes a person who is steady and reliable. So God has declared himself as one who can be relied upon, as one who is trustworthy. Sixth, God revealed himself as keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation. This is the word chesed, as discussed earlier, but the insistence here is that God will be loyal to do what he has said forever. 
Seventh, God revealed himself as one who forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. This is a strange translation. The Hebrew is not literally forgiving, but rather lifting up or carrying iniquity and transgression and sin. This again has to do with God's patience. The Apostle Paul has referred to this quality of God in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, when he wrote the following of what God had done in Jesus for us. He did this to show his righteousness, Paul writes, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. So God has revealed that he will bear patiently with those who sin for a time, but not forever, as is clarified in the next phrase. Eighth, God revealed himself as one who by no means clears the guilty. That whole phrase is actually one Hebrew word, the word yeneke, which comes from the verb naka. In the form of naka in this verse, it's in the PL stem, it means to hold innocent or to acquit. So in this phrase, God has declared that his patience with sin does not mean that he has acquitted those described in the previous phrase, those who have committed iniquity, transgression, and sin. In fact, God reveals himself as one who will not acquit such people. In the context of the covenant of Sinai, these terms should really be taken together as describing one either who has rebelled against God, something like Numbers 15 calls a high-handed sin, or one who has refused to repent and return to relationship with God and neighbor through the processes explained in the Torah. Ninth, God has revealed himself as one who visits the iniquity of parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. In this phrase, God has declared that the iniquity or the consequences of the guilt of such people as described earlier will be borne by their families to the third and fourth generation. So in other words, God is willing to bear patiently with rebellion against the stipulations of God's covenant. But those who will not repent will not be acquitted. Instead, both they and their children after them will bear the consequences of their rebellion against God. Now there are Christians today who believe that the declarations preserved for us in 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 and 1 John chapter 4 verse 16, both of which say God is love, indicate that either God never was or is no longer as he described himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 through 7. But this is a woeful misinterpretation of 1 John's intention. In fact, when read in context, the larger passage in which 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, and verse 16 are to be found describes God much as God described himself in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through chapter 5, verse 5 says the following, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We notice that in context, John speaks of love as a kind of loyalty and faithful commitment to God and to our neighbors. And this is not surprising, since Jesus himself summarized the requirements of God in the covenant of Sinai as practical ways in which God was asking his people to love the Lord their God with all their heart, strength, and selves, and to love their neighbors as themselves. This for John is the essential character of God. God does not think of himself as better than others. Instead, God acts in the best interest of all of his creatures. We too are to behave similarly. And according to the Apostle John, those who live in these ways have no need to fear. They can approach God in boldness because they have lived according to God's will. However, just as God described himself to Moses, For those who do not live in these ways, instead hating their neighbors, that is, living selfishly and living in ways that do not consider the best interest of their neighbors, they have much to fear. For as John has said in 1 John 5, verse 3, For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And relatedly, our love of our neighbors is that we do not consider our interests to be of more importance than theirs. So to return to the thought with which this discussion began, Why does humanity no longer fear God? Well, certainly some have come to believe there is no God to fear. But for those who do believe in God, they have lost their fear because they've come to believe that what the scriptures mean by God is love is that God does not become angry, God does not judge, God will not punish, and so on. This is a woeful error. Luke has told us that Jesus was required to carry the cross piece of the apparatus on which he would be crucified. Historians tell us that this was common. However, Luke has also told us that at some point, a man named Simon was made to carry the piece for Jesus. The Apostle John would later insist in John chapter 19, verse 17, that Jesus carried the cross by himself. This is an interesting difference and one that's hard to explain. Some have said that perhaps Jesus and Simon carried the cross piece together. However, neither of the gospel accounts in question say that. Others have suggested that Jesus started out carrying his own cross, but due to his weakened state from the previous flogging, he could not complete the journey. But again, neither of the gospels in question indicate that either. My suspicion is that Simon was assigned initially to carry the cross for Jesus, as Lucas told us, but that Jesus refused that offer, insisting instead on carrying the cross himself, as John has told us. John was, after all, the only of the apostles who was an eyewitness to Jesus' crucifixion, and so he likely had additional information to which Luke was not privy. In any case, Luke has also told us that a great number of people followed Jesus, including some women who were mourning over him. Dr. Grant Osborne, in his commentary Luke verse by verse, has suggested that these may have been professional mourners who were assigned to mourn in circumstances like these, which was not uncommon in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. Whatever the case, as Dr. Osborne has also observed, Jesus used their mourning for him as an occasion to repeat the lament for Jerusalem he had proclaimed when he first entered the city, in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. On that occasion, Luke recounted the following. As he, Jesus, came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. 
Jesus' words as he was making his way to his execution by crucifixion were similar. Luke has recollected the scene as follows in Luke chapter 23, verses 28 to 31. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? It is for this reason that I began our discussion today with a reflection on the fear of the Lord. Both of Jesus' laments over the city of Jerusalem prophesied a time in the near future when God would bring judgment on the city, a prophecy fulfilled in the Roman destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 and the Roman destruction of the city in A.D. 135. In Jesus' final lament, he recalled a prophecy of the prophet Hosea. The oracle is quite long and spans multiple chapters. However, the following section, found in Hosea chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, is the specific context from which Jesus quoted. The text reads as follows. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their pillars. For now they will say, We have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. And a king, what could he do for us? They utter mere words. With empty oaths they make covenants. So litigation springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria tremble for the calf of Betaven. Its people shall mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests shall wail over it over its glory that has departed from it. The thing itself shall be carried to Assyria as tribute to the great king. Ephraim shall be put to shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his idol. Samaria's king shall perish like a chip on the face of the waters. The high places of Aven, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, Fall on us. In Hosea's context, Israel was the northern kingdom of Israel, and Samaria was its capital. In making this reference, Jesus was in part saying that what had happened to the northern capital of the kingdom of Israel was soon to happen to the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. This was a devastating prophecy, because the northern capital of Samaria had been utterly destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. Jerusalem, on the other hand, had survived the conquest of the southern kingdom by the Babylonian Empire, and it had stood until Jesus' own day. But Jesus prophesied in his lament that the days of even Jerusalem were then numbered. Why? Well, Jesus had informed us already in his first lament upon entering the city of Jerusalem earlier that week, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The result of this judgment, according to Jesus, would be as Hosea had prophesied with respect to the fall of the northern Israelite capital of Samaria. They shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, Fall on us. In commenting on this citation from Hosea, Dr. Osborne has opined, It's more preferable to endure a swift death than to face a wrathful God. However, I don't think a swift death is what this behavior is meant to convey. My sense of asking the mountains to cover them and the hills to fall on them is the idea of hiding oneself from the view of God. We see a similar desire expressed by Job in Job chapter 14 verse 13 when Job prayed to God, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Now, of course, Sheol is the place of the dead, but Job's desire was not to remain dead. Rather, Job wished that he could be hidden from God's wrath and then brought back when God's judgment had been completed. That's the sense of his desire to be remembered. 
A similar desire is also in view in the response of unrepentant people to God's judgment in Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 to 17 where we're told the following. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and there came a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree drops its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll rolling itself up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the magnates and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And of course, this instinct to hide from God out of fear of punishment was first manifested by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden just after they had rebelled against God by eating of the tree of good and evil knowledge. We recall that Genesis has recollected the event as follows in Genesis chapter 3 verses 8 through 11. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? What Jesus proclaimed prophetically upon his final entrance into Jerusalem and on his way out of Jerusalem to be crucified, was that in rejecting, condemning, and crucifying him, they were essentially, in the context of Genesis, choosing the tree of good and evil knowledge over God. They were essentially, in the context of Hosea, choosing to worship the calf of Bedaven over God. They were essentially, in the later context of Revelation, choosing to worship the beast over God. In all these cases, the sins in which the people had been engaged caused them to fear the judgment of God when they heard the sound of his walking to such an extent that they sought any possible way to hide themselves from him. As the exile from Eden had been God's judgment, and as the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel had been God's judgment, so Jesus prophesied the coming destruction of Jerusalem was to be understood as God's judgment as well. Because the people of God had not feared him when the wood was green, they would come to fear him when the wood was dried and set aflame. The fear of God was meant to lead God's people to righteousness, and if they misstepped, then to repentance. But for the impenitent and the rebellious, the fear of the Lord leads only to despair. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 has told us that the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And long before that proverb was written, Moses had already told the Israelites on the foothills of Mount Sinai the following, in Exodus chapter 20 verse 20, Do not be afraid, for God has only come to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. And Jesus himself had spoken similarly during his ministry, as recounted in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, when he said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. There is no way to avoid the fear of the Lord. Either we will fear him in advance of choosing to do wickedness, or we will fear his judgment in the wake of doing wickedness. To put it in more biblical terms, the fear of Yahweh is either the beginning of wisdom or the last desperate act of the finally impenitent. But before we come down too harshly on the failure of Jesus' contemporaries with respect to who he was, we must recall the beginning of Jesus' lamentation, uttered upon his final entrance into Jerusalem that week. Jesus had said in Luke chapter 19, verse 42, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. 
And the question we must then ask is this, hidden by whom? And the answer is perplexing, and it's this, hidden by God. Paul has addressed this reality in two places in the New Testament. The first is to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6-8, through 8, which says, Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then perhaps more clearly, Paul wrote the following in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 32. So that you may not claim to be wiser than you are, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, Out of Zion will come the Deliverer. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now become disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. This was Jesus' lament over Jerusalem. He had longed to reveal himself to his own people in a way by which they would recognize him. But Jesus could not do that during his first coming. Why not? Well, first, as Paul has revealed in 1 Corinthians, by concealing himself in the flesh of Jesus, God was at the same time concealing himself from the spiritual forces of evil. Why? Because the redemption, salvation, justification, reconciliation, and glorification of humanity required the death of one who was both fully God and fully human. Had they known who he was, they would not have crucified Jesus. Second, if the people of Israel had recognized Jesus immediately, then the kingdom of God would have been inaugurated then. But according to Paul, God wanted to redeem not only Israel, but all nations, as he had promised Abraham from the beginning. And those nations at that time were enslaved to false gods and to the spirits of evil in the heavenly realms. So God blinded the eyes of the larger portion of his own people, so as to invite Gentiles into the kingdom. Even so, Paul has also prophesied that once the full number of Gentiles has come in, God will soften the hearts of his people and open their eyes to the reality of Jesus. So then, were Jesus' contemporaries innocent before God for the rejection and condemnation of Jesus? The biblical answer is both yes and no. God hardened their hearts, according to Paul. But God hardened them in the direction they were already pointed. God had not decreed or intended the sins in which their ancestors had lived, nor had God decreed or intended the sins they were then committing, which Jesus exposed during his ministry. What God did was harden their hearts so that they would not repent and follow Jesus. And of course, God did not harden all of their hearts. As Paul declared earlier in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, I asked then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself, Paul says, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine reply to him? I have kept for myself seven thousand who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. The implication of Paul's understanding is that some Israelites followed Jesus immediately, 
because God chose to allow them to see and to repent. The others were hardened, both so that Jesus would be crucified, and so that a way might be made for the Gentiles to enter into covenant relationship with the God of Israel. And Paul has declared that after the full number of Gentiles has come in, God will release the hardening of Israel's heart toward Jesus and allow all those who are willing to repent and follow him. On that day, the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 through chapter 13 verse 1 will be fulfilled, which says the following, And I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, and their wives by themselves, and all the families that are left, each by itself and their wives by themselves. On that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. May all who love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became flesh in the person of Jesus, pray for that day to come, for it will come only on a day of God's choosing. As Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time before his crucifixion, and as he carried his cross to the place of his death, he mourned and lamented over the fact that Zechariah's prophecy was still a long way off. How Jesus longed for his people to receive all that God had promised on that day. But the hardening of the larger portion of Israel was necessary for God's plan of the redemption of all humanity to move forward. The temple and Jerusalem were to be destroyed, and God's people were to be scattered again amongst the nations, so that the message of the coming of Jesus might come to every place under heaven. And then... When the full number of Gentiles has come in, and the heart of Israel has been softened, the end will come. God will judge the finally impenitent. The righteous dead will be raised, and all who have called Jesus Lord will meet him in the air and rejoice at the coming of his kingdom. That day was the joy set before Jesus. But on this day, on the day he carried his cross, he felt no joy. He felt only sorrow for his own people, for the children of Abraham, for the hardening of the hearts of Israel. But he endured it, knowing that by his sacrifice, all humanity, first Israel and then the Gentiles, would be opened to repentance and invited into relationship with God through him. May those who have ears to hear Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen.